Hello and welcome back to Limited Time Only. I'm Andrew Laird, and on today's episode, we're going to analyze the competitiveness of each so rare limited card division and see which regions may be the best to target from a reward perspective. Our last episode of this series touched on the differences between submitted lineups and viable lineups in limited competitions, including why using the latter to determine reward probabilities provides a clearer picture of what we can win. Today, we we'll utilize that methodology to begin our analysis. Using the viable lineups per reward calculation, we can easily see the differences in probabilities for winning cards between Global All-Star, U23, Champion Europe, Challenger Europe, America, and Asia. Now, it's worth noting that there have only been 22 Asia competitions because of when limited cards were initially released versus the J and K League schedules, but we still have sufficient data to discuss the other regions. Putting all these charts together gives us a bit of a messy graph, but we can work our way through it to at least recognize the trend lines, which provide a comparison to which divisions may be more competitive when it comes to how many viable lineups are competing for each reward. Actually, before we go into that, let's see if there's a region or regions that have a higher number of viable lineups per submitted lineups. We know that submitting a lineup with five players with matches immediately gives us a head start over those that don't, and that many people submit lineups that don't but it's worth looking at whether certain regions have more viable lineups among those submitted. This chart of the percentage of submitted lineups that were viable for each region between game weeks 194 and 238 isn't really helping us get away from the messy graphs. And part of it is because the actual football calendar did us no favors thanks to international play and the winter breaks. So instead of looking on a game week by game week basis, Let's compare the mean and median of viable to submitted lineups for each competition over that span. So firstly, this is not a perfect avenue for analyzing which regions are the most competitive, especially because the time frame includes the MLS playoffs and the end of the Asia schedule, which included some Asian Champions League games, meaning there weren't many lineups submitted anyway. But it's fairly clear that we see far more viable lineups as a percentage of the submitted ones in Champion Europe than, say, Global All-Star or U23. There are a few reasonable explanations for why this is the case, one of which is simply that the five leagues that comprise Champion Europe have very similar schedules from a week-to-week -week basis. The licensed teams in Challenger Europe range from all over, including ones that take extended breaks like the Russian Premier League and Austrian Bundesliga. If so rare managers have players from those leagues in their lineups, they may be submitting non-viable lineups during their winter breaks, which lowers the percentage of viable lineups. All-Star and U23 obviously have that issue on a much larger scale, as managers may have a player or two from Champion Europe mixed with players from the J-League and Major League Soccer who are currently in their off-seasons. As a result, we see more non-viable lineups there. Even the American division has this issue, as leagues in Mexico and Argentina start before the United States, which starts before Brazil. More league diversity leads to more non-viable lineups until all leagues are playing, and since Champion Europe has the least amount of diversity, we see more viable lineups per submitted lineups. So we know that on average, having a viable lineup in Champion Europe is more important than any other competition. That's not to say it's unimportant in the others, but we know we compete against more viable lineups, at least as a percentage of all lineups, in Champion Europe than anywhere else. Let's go back to our messy chart showing the number of viable lineups per reward in each game week. The data is certainly helpful looking at each game week, but the trend lines give us a better comparative indicator in terms of which regions are the most competitive based on the number of viable lineups competing for each reward. In fact, let's take out the data points and focus only on the trend lines, even if the trends themselves aren't that defined. So remember, as we discussed in our last video, we want the number of viable lineups per reward to be as low as possible because it means we're competing against fewer entries for each reward. You'd rather compete for a card against 10 other lineups than 100, right? And what we see is that Champion Europe requires us to compete against more viable lineups than any other region, with the trend line indicating that we're competing against roughly seven viable lineups for each reward. Challenger Europe is next, though it's fairly close to Global All-Star, and with America and Asia showing more dramatic movements because of their end-of-season situations. U23 may be the most surprising, given how few viable lineups are competing for each reward. But with a number of game weeks over this time frame, with only a few hundred viable lineups for dozens or even hundreds of rewards, 
it seems having a viable lineup in U23 is a huge head start toward winning cards. So we've looked at how many of the submitted lineups are actually viable in each region, as well as the trends for how many viable lineups per reward there have been. So let's move to the final piece. How many fantasy points have been required to win cards in each region? This chart plots out the minimum fantasy points needed to win a reward in each limited competition from game week 194 through game week 238, with accompanying trend lines to help compare each region. The minimum fantasy points needed to win a reward is essentially the score needed to win the last tier 3 card. And we see from the data that more often than any other region, Champion Europe requires the highest scores, followed by Challenger Europe and Global All-Star. Similarly to the viable lineups per reward, we see fairly low scores required to win cards in U23, though the trend seems to be increasing at a faster rate than the other divisions that have had regular schedules during the time frame. And, unsurprisingly, we see similar trends when we look specifically at the minimum fantasy points required to win Star, Tier 1, and Tier 2 rewards. So how do we use this information when it comes to deciding where to submit our teams? One key tool we have at SoRare Data is our Lineup Builder, which shows detailed reward information for upcoming game weeks, including the average fantasy points scored by podium winners, as well as the score ranges for Tier 0, Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 rewards over the past 15 game weeks. Using this information, you can see which situations may be the best to exploit given your gallery, helping you to make your contest entries as competitive as ever. And next time, we'll look at the star reward tier in each region to see if your chances of winning certain players are better in one competition over another.